people don't just want a life of comfort. They want a life of dignity. They want a life of self-determination. A life of equal outcomes is not nearly as enriching as a life of equal opportunity. I tell you, the party that speaks to that desire, the party that tries to make it concrete and real, that's the party that will win in November. We are that party. We're heading back to the floor of the conference right now. Mark Morano joins us. He's the publisher of the Climate Depot website. Uh, Mark, I know your specialty is looking at uh, climate science uh, issues. Now, how big of a role do you predict the whole energy, climate, global warming discussion to play at the conference? I expect it to be a very large part of this conference. What's happening in our midterm election here, our midterm congressional election, is this is the year President Obama is walking away from anything in Congress and is doing everything through executive orders. So this is going to be an issue in every single congressional race, every single Senate race. There is going to be an issue of whether coal plants are going to be allowed to remain open, whether fracking of natural gas will be able to continue without massive government intervention and regulations that, are, that could be online in the next couple years. So every congressional candidate is tuned into this. And as a result, CPAC, conservative base of the movement, is very tuned into this because they're looking right now at trillions of dollars of cost to the economy. They're looking right now at energy blackouts if the war on coal continues, and coal, which is 40% of U.S. electricity or high 30s, is wiped out or continued to be crippled. So this is going to be a huge issue, and it's all driven, of course, by the global warming scientific claims. Um, and they're trying to say we need to can carbon-based energy in order to uh, uh, fight global warming. Now, to bring it back to Canada, Keystone XL, I don't think it was originally a big issue for American politicians when the company here in Canada first uh, put the proposal forward. It's become a much larger issue, still up in the air. Uh, do you think it's going to be discussed this weekend? Yes, I do. That is, of course, a big issue. It's become more and more prominent in American politics. We had just this week a uh, MSNBC anchor come out a couple weeks ago and announced he supported it. Now, MSNBC is the American political left. He was inundated. He was attacked. He's now come out and opposed it because the left senses they're losing this issue right now. There have been major predictions that President Obama will ultimately uh, endorse and allow this Keystone Pipeline. So I think what's happening here at CPAC is we're doing as much as we can, the momentum to push the pressure, keep the pressure on President Obama because it looks like it will eventually be approved uh, I don't know if that's going to be three months from now or even another year or so from now, but it looks like it's going to happen at some point. Now, I know the politics on the issue is all about the sell. And one of the interesting things with the Keystone argument is, is a lot of the facts aren't out there that, for instance, there's already about 80 pipelines uh, with hydrocarbons on them going between Canada and the U.S. You know, one more is not sort of the, uh, the, the Earth's shattering end of the world, as Daryl Hannah would have people believe, but it still sticks in the minds of some people. And there's a lot of people in Canada or in the U.S. Who, who do believe the Daryl Hannahs of the world there. So for, for, from the conference end of yes. things, I mean, what, what sort of sell angle do, do people have to do to kind of recapture the debate in their favor? Well, I think what we've done is, first of all, we've had a lot of fun at the expense of the Keystone uh, protesters. Just this week, we had, I think it was hundreds of young people who were arrested in front of the White House protesting this. And they were faced with very cold weather. We had fun tweeting out uh, and, and posting all their comments about how cold it was. And a lot of them were looking forward to get arrested, to get into the warm jail cell. Of course, Washington was hit with another major spring snowstorm as the U.S. Uh, is the second, third snowiest year. So it's kind of ironic the gore effect hit them. So we're pointing that out, the absurdity of all these young people possibly ruining their career lives by getting arrest records on, on their record to protest a pipeline, which, as you mentioned, Daryl Hannah, we have NASA's James Hansen. They've come out and said it's game over for the climate. 
when we know Canadian scientists like Andrew Weaver and other scientists have said it wouldn't even make a detectable impact whether Canadian Keystone goes through fully or not. So that even the global warming scientists admit it's had no impact on the climate, yet that's the horse that the Keystone Pipeline protesters rode on. So we here at CPAC, we're having a panel. We had a panel today on global warming and this came up. We talked about how even the liberals in America, like a magazine like New Yorker magazine says this was the wrong fight for environmentalists to pick. There was a losing battle for them from the beginning. They didn't have the science, they didn't have the momentum, and they didn't have the logic and reason on their side. But they took it anyway, and they're paying a big price. Uh, Mark, one thing that I'm always saying on this network is that a lot of the activists have managed to push the idea that, that people just have carte blanche uh, resource extraction. But when we approved the Northern Gateway approval, we didn't approve it. There were 207 conditions. As you know, the State Department process is very detailed. But still, again, the activists are kind of managing to set a tone, suggesting that it's some crazy Wild West deregulated sphere, whereas the truth is it's a lot more in the center. And, and what are people, what can people at the conference do and prospective politicians do to change that narrative in, in the public conscious? Well, you're right. I mean, first of all, the Keystone Pipeline had to go through governors and state by state, all sorts of environmental impact studies, economic assessments. And that, of course, had to go through, as you mentioned, the State Department assessments. It's going through additional White House reviews. Um, and on all these areas along where the pipeline would run, it has environmental impact studies. It's taken years, and it's going to probably take years more. So anyone who suggests that Keystone Pipeline was a rubber stamp uh, product of a deregulated energy environment isn't even looking rudimentally at the basic facts. So what we're doing at this conference is pointing out what I'm just telling you. This is absurd for something like this to take as long as it has. Interestingly enough, a major part of President Obama's political base, the American labor unions, which are part of the Democratic Party here in the United States, have been completely for this Keystone Pipeline. So President Obama has been at odds with a key constituency of his base. In fact, one of the union presidents, Terry O'Sullivan of La Una, has said that President Obama has chosen environmentalists over American jobs by delaying the pipeline. So the president is sort of in a, he wins, he loses if he, if he approves it and he loses if he doesn't doesn't approve it approach right now, but it looks like the momentum is for him to eventually approve it. Okay, Mark, I gotta let you go in a second, but before I do, it would behoove me to not ask you this since you're on the convention floor. Who's, lo who's looking the most presidential there, the, the best to be a presidential contender? It's a very good question. You know, Chris Christie, who has not been generally warmly received by conservatives in the past, got a standing ovation here today, earlier today. Uh, and Bobby Jindal, another one who's been uh, uh, touted as a presidential candidate, spoke as well. Uh, Rick Santorum is coming here, and all the other candidates. It's hard to say this early on, uh, but I would say Chris Christie is really trying to do the most repair work given his scandal in New Jersey with the bridge, given his bear hug, if you will, of President Obama during Hurricane Sandy, which has turned many in the Republican Party off of Chris Christie. We'll see what kind of rebuilding Chris Christie can do. Uh, but it's, it's very hard. Rand Paul, of course, is another major contender. Marco Rubio is frequently mentioned. Uh, there's a, it's a wide open field still. Uh, all right, Mark, thanks for your analysis.